So uh, here we are again with another one of our uh, Cromwellian conversations, um, which again, recording from home. And you'll notice today that I am not alone. Um, I'm delighted to have with me today, uh, Paul Lay, who many of you will know as the editor of History Today magazine, uh, but also uh, Paul is one of our trustees of the Cromwell Museum. He is also uh, the author of this excellent book, um, Where Providence Lost, which is uh, on Cromwell's protectorate. So uh, rather than me droning on on my own today, uh, it's brilliant to have uh, a historian with us who can chat more about this particular period. Paul, thank you very much for joining us this morning and uh, particularly on this bank holiday as well. So I um, hope you're having a good year day commemorations and what have you. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Yeah, Great yeah, to be here. Excellent. Um, so, uh, I mean, just to start off, first of all, you sort of uh, have the whole sort of toy box of history to play with in your kind of your day job, as it were. So what persuaded you to write about Cromwell and what, what, why particularly about Protectorate? Well, I was very lucky um, when I was an undergraduate uh, that I was at Birkbeck, which had an absolutely fantastic early modern collection of scholars, uh, people like Barry Coward, Patrick uh, Little, Michael Hunter, and there were Vanessa Harding, there were all kinds of people there who were brilliant. And so that became an area on which I've concentrated ever since. Um, but it's interesting you talk about being editor of History Today, you see a lot of things, you get quite a good overview of what's in and what's out in history. Mm. And I've always been slightly puzzled uh, to the relative neglect of the mid 17th century, so far as the public goes, you know, if you compare it yeah. to the Tudors, for example, uh, it doesn't have anything like the purchase um, that the Tudor period has. And I've, I've puzzled as to why that is, and we could probably spend uh, the next 24 hours just discussing <laughs> <laughs> it. We, we, we've only we, got 20 minutes. So <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll that right. But it's doubly puzzling, uh, the protectorate and the 17th century in general, and the protectorate is the sort of neglected bit of this neglected period of history. Mm -hmm. uh, it's doubly puzzling because it's been a field in which so much superb scholarship has been made. I just think of the historians who've ploughed this burrow, whether it's the mid 17th century or the protectorate in general, and it's a stellar cast of brilliant historians and yet that i don't think they've received the kind of recognition or publicity that they perhaps deserve with the wider public mm. so providence loss is to a certain extent born of frustration at this to try and synthesize the thoughts and works of these very very distinguished historians and to package it for a wider general audience because it just seemed to be, I mean, even uh, with, you know, the public perception of Cromwell, um, obviously other than his early life, which actually we know very little about anyway, um, the, the bit that everybody tends to concentrate on in terms of the popular perception tends to be things like obviously the Civil War, uh, the trial and execution of the King, Ireland, e even though that, uh, you know, it's arguably the period of his life where actually he's most significant, you know, he's the central figure as, as the protectorate. And yet, it's the, again, it seems to be the bit of his life that, again, almost seems to be a footnote in the popular imagination doesn't it absolutely and it's and i don't really understand that because when i look at the protectorate it's it's undoubtedly one of the strangest periods in british history mm. it's also one that's absolutely packed with incident bizarre characters um <laughs> things that are very much of their time and yet also there's a resonance to what we think of as important now relationship with Europe, for example, mm. the relationship between the constituent nations of the United Kingdom, uh, transatlantic relations. This is when the British Empire takes shape in some way, particularly in the New World. Um, there's all kinds of resonance there about Parliament, the role of Parliament, the role of monarchy. All these things resonate to this day. And one would think that the protectorate would be this field that would hugely interest the wider public. And yet that hasn't really been the case until now, I hope, anyway. <laughs> but, 
<laughs> I think certainly the amount of interest obviously the books generated and uh, hopefully also uh, the museums chipping into certainly in terms of things at the moment I think uh, certainly seems to be paying dividends with that so let's hope that continues so uh, so this sort of strange period sort of kicks off with this um, uh, iconic moments in uh, April 1653 where Cromwell stands up in Parliament and starts castigating his fellow peers depending on the version of the, the speech you know he sort of starts calling them sordid prostitutes and uh, know that they've got no more religion than his horse which sounds very Cromwellian. Um, <laughs> did, did, did you, do, do you think he sort of plans this? I mean he, he's very opaque in terms of his motivations in certain parts of his career, isn't he? I mean, did he plan this? Was it on the spur of the moment? You know, uh, what, what, what do you think the kind of background and motivation to this event was? He's such a slippery figure of these. I mean, I always refer to Blair Wooden's wonderful phrase that Cromwell is practised at not knowing. Yeah. He's always slightly elusive, slightly distant when these events, these ruptures occur. And yet, they repeat themselves so <laughs> commonly that one thinks there has to be knowledge. This is the man, after all, who I think it was the Venetian ambassador said, you know, nothing gets past this man. He knows everything. This is the man who knows everything in the kingdom. So the truth is, I don't think we can ever know and never will know. But all the evidence that we have suggests that Cromwell knows what's going on or at least has some hint or some shaping of these events no doubt in my mind he he, he sort of uh, seems to be very much somebody who uh today i think the modern term would be plausible deniability um <laughs> in terms of the, the the way he kind of treats some of these things doesn't he at various points in his career likewise presumably you know also pride's purge and things like that as well yeah no absolutely absolutely yeah. So the, the, the popular perception is then that sort of it's sort of then um, the, the, there's a kind of immediate leap into sort of the protectorate uh, as we do sort of, you know, uh, almost a sort of uh, form of dictatorship is in many people's minds. But there's this sort of strange period in between throughout the rest of 1653, isn't there, where there is effectively this, this whole process with the bare bones parliament and the sort of development of this constitutional settlement. T talk us through a little bit about how, how that worked and what perhaps sort of some of the thinking behind that was. Well, when the when the rump is dissolved, I think it's fair to say that Cromwell becomes just about as powerful a figure as there's ever been in British history, at least in his potential. Yeah. Um, and this is where the question of that dictatorship is difficult. I mean, it's a slightly anachronistic idea of Cromwell as a dictator. It's one that was repeated a lot in the 1930s for obvious uh, for obvious reasons with those parallels. But even had he had those ambitions the early modern state is not capable of the kind of dictatorship that we are, are used to with the, the 20th century for example the great dictators the, there the, the government and machine he, isn't there to support it basically there um uh, the means of communication is not there the kind of transport is right it's just not not feasible in, mm. in any meaningful modern sense and also there's the argument that cromwell encourages parliament. I mean, one of the things about Cromwell is that he seems to like the idea of parliament. I mean, he has enough of them, yeah. but he doesn't like the reality of them. But he does try, and, goes, and the first one of these, of course, is the nominated assembly, which comes around in July 1653, which, which is the brainchild of Thomas Harrison, essentially, who's a former, um, former commander in the army, a uh, very distinguished figure, a lawyer, um, but also deeply religious fundamentalist who leads a group of people called Fifth Monarchists. Uh, I won't go into great detail in that, but it's very much on the edges of 17th century eschatological beliefs who essentially believe that England is ultimately uh, an elect nation. And there's a lot of that about. And of course, it became known as uh, the nominated assembly has become known as the bare bones parliament after mm. one of its members praise got bare bones. it's actually a more effective parliament than one might think given the fact that it's associated with religious fundamentalism and uh, the balmier aspects of it um, <laughs> it's, um it's it's got quite a few lawyers in there there's always quite a few lawyers in there, this parliament 
and the power of the fundamentalists is not that good. It's quite effective, but again, I think because of some of the opposition towards the army, and let's always remember the army is the fundamental of this whole regime. This is what it rests on, is the power of the army. Um, the dissatisfaction there um, means that again, we see it dissolved and off it goes. And so power then, uh, the kind of ideological power of the regime, shifts from Harrison's religious fundamentalist kind of ideal, uh, his Old Testament ideal, to another very, very significant figure in the regime, the man who at the time was seen very much as um, Cromwell's second in command is heir apparent in many ways within yeah. the Republic or the particular, which is John Lambert, mm -hmm. who is a very, very distinguished uh, cavalry commander. Um, he's someone who uh, is somewhat cavalier, you might say. He's quite a glamorous, <laughs> vain figure in yeah. terms of his appearance. But some military historians argue that he was an even greater cavalry commander than, than Cromwell himself. He's certainly uh, a, a kind of um, equal to Cromwell in his achievements. And he... Uh, thinks a great deal while the nominated assembly is going on. He's at his house in Wimbledon and he constructs essentially what is the world's first written constitution, which is the instrument of government, which tries to put the protectorate on a kind of sound footing. So he replaces, uh, simplifying things rather, he replaces the old trinity of King uh, lords and commons with another trinity of the protector which is a new position which Cromwell will have they know that Cromwell won't accept the monarchy the mm -hmm. title of king which would have been the obvious thing to do so there's the monarch and then there's uh, sorry there's the protector then there's the council and then there's parliament which as we can see by this time is a is a pretty denuded affair and mm -hmm. so Cromwell uh, accepts this title of lord protector um, and over time, it becomes a quasi-monarchical position. And the first of these um, protectorate parliaments is, is assembled in um, September 1654. But as you can imagine, it's a deeply dis divisive project mm. because those believers in the good old cause, people like Hesselrig and Henry Vane, and of course, John Milton, um, see this as a betrayal of the good old cause, the old ideal, the Republican ideals that they had and being replaced by what is a quasi monarchy uh, with great suspicion about the ambition of Cromwell and the people around him. Because there, there is no roadmap for this, is there? I mean, um, uh, you know, they're, they're, the, the Civil War wasn't started with the idea of uh, setting up a republic. It was to bring the king to heel. Um, you know, it, it, it's almost become a republic not by accident more than design in a way, really. Um, and, you know, the, the last time that you've got a significant nation state on a, on a pure republican basis, as opposed to having sort of, you know, a stadtholder in Holland or a doge in Venice, yeah. is really back in ancient Rome. So, you know, where do they look to for a model for this? So they're sort of kind of almost making it up as they go along in a way, really. No, absolutely. I mean, I think there is an element of, of the Venetian aspect to it informs it. I mean, later on, of course, as James Harrington's great political work, Oceana, mm. it's very much modelled and was intended as a kind of advice book to Cromwell. Uh, explicitly, uh, which is based upon the Venetian constitution. So there's all kinds of ideas. And of course, Milton was very uh, aware of classical republicanism. So that's feeding into it. But you're absolutely right. From the moment the king was executed, that very bold decision had been made and no one really quite knew what to do next. And by the time uh, the first parliament, the first protectorate parliament is there, there's a lot of division and it's plain that there's not the kind of settlement that one perhaps expected. Um, and yet at the same time, there's very little real danger externally for the regime. It's got a very strong army and navy. It's got very, and so I think what happens then is that the Elizabethan worldview that I think informs people like Cromwell and those around him, I mean, it's quite possible that the only book 
non-religious book that Cromwell ever read is Walter Raleigh's History of the World, yeah. which outlines a very providential English exceptionalist Puritan Protestantism. And of course, what Raleigh did was take on the Spanish in the New World. Mm. And there's a very interesting character who comes into the Cromwellian circle. There's a person called Thomas Gage, who has one of the most extraordinary lives of the 17th century, because he comes from an English recusant family, uh, which is obviously committed to Catholicism, and they send him away uh, to Europe to become a priest. Normally, that would take place in saint Omer, but he actually ends up in Spain as a Dominican. And um, eventually, to cut a very long story short, he ends up in the New World, in Central America. Uh, he's a very formidable linguist. He speaks the languages of the Pokemon Maya, for example. He's the first Englishman to write about chocolate. He talks about all kinds of things. He's, it, he's written a book called The English American, which is the most extraordinary work. Mm. But at some time during these travels, he begins to have doubts about his religious beliefs. And again, to cut a long story short, he ends up back in England and converts to the Puritan wing of the Church of England and becomes of the National Church and becomes eventually quite a follower of Cromwell, quite a supporter of Cromwell. And he suggests that the Spanish in the New World, they're nothing, they're very weak, they're decadent, the native peoples there, the indigenous peoples there are very much against their rule. Mm -hmm. And if the English turn up there with their army, their navy, they'll be kicking at an open door and the New World and all its wealth will be there, the wealth of Fratar, the wealth of Mexico, the wealth of the mines in Peru, it can all be England's, this wonderful nation. And we know it can be England's because look, the, the people around Cromwell have fought this religious war and God is on their side. He was on their side at Dunbar, he was on their side at Worcester. Why not call on his providence now and take on the Spanish foe in Habsburg in his very Elizabethan worldview? they decide to do that eventually. Cromwell is very keen on this project, which eventually becomes known as the Western Design. John Lambert is not and sees it as a potential catastrophe. And almost inevitably, Hubris becomes nemesis. They decide to attack the island of Hispaniola in a force led by uh, the Admiral William Penn, and the army led by a person called Robert Venables, who's um, been very close to Cromwell in the past, uh, fought in Ireland, was with, was with him in the Irish campaign, and actually feels he's not got the recognition he deserves. He finally gets it, off they go to Hispaniola. Uh, much of the planning done by John Desborough is of course um, mm. Cromwell's brother-in-law, but, the, the, but it's so poor, the planning, um, that it is a complete catastrophe and Penn and Venables try to amend it somewhat by taking Jamaica, which is then seen as very much backwater. They return to England, they're thrown into the Tower of London, there's disgrace. And there's no doubt to my mind that this deeply affects Cromwell because here we have what the title of the book is, Providence Lost, mm. is that God's providence has been withdrawn. And the question that Cromwell and those around him there, and particularly Cromwell, why? Why has God withdrawn his providence? I mean, that's the thing that affects him throughout his life, isn't he? He's sort of, he's very much waiting for whatever God's message is this week in terms of what he should be doing. And uh, and that must have affected him quite deeply. And it's something you go in quite detail in the book, isn't it? Um, uh, this whole uh, imperial colonial adventure, which again is something that a lot of people tend to gloss over when talking about the protectorate. It's not something that's widely covered. I mean, why do you think they sort of, I mean, bearing in mind that all the other things that the country was facing at the time, you 
has come out of all of this upheaval, civil war, the world's turned upside down is this sort of common phrase. It, it seems remarkable in a way really that suddenly the sort of focus shouldn't be, you know, this imperial adventure on the other side of the world in a way really. It, it, it's bizarre, I mean it's a classic case of hubris, but in theory on paper they have the means uh, to, to fulfill this kind of project. I mean, the army is battle tested, it's, it's hardened, it's disciplined, it has this, I mean, you know, this is the army that calls itself the saints. They have mm -hmm. this incredible belief in themselves and their ability and their relationship with the divine. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, and they have this incredibly powerful navy as well, uh, which I think people often forget about this period. So it's not that irrational the desire but i think it shows how one monarchical the regime has become because i think this is so informed as i've said by an elizabethan worldview this is just that kind of thinking this exceptionalist thinking um so that's that's part of it because the failure then opens up the idea you know what have we done wrong and cromwell has this extraordinary phrase when he talks about the British people being under circumcision, but raw, by which he means... Which is, which is a terrifying image. <laughs> absolutely terrifying image. It's a very Cromwellian statement. I yeah. Think. But what I think he means by that is that, yes, we are on the way to this promised land. Mm -hmm. This idea as Israel was the chosen people of the Old Testament, then England will be the chosen nation of the new that's that's the ideal and so we're on the way there Cromwell is telling people but we're not there yet and it's very, can... it's very much this concept he's trying to introduce of a kind of you know almost a godly nation isn't it sort Absolutely. of you know and uh, uh, but that, I mean how does he go about trying to construct this in a sort of in a more literal sense would you say well no uh, that, that's precisely it um the the English people have not uh, gone through the necessary process of moral reformation and the idea of how to reform them is I think seeded first of all in the way in which the regime defeats a royalist rising in the West Country um, known as the Penruddock Rising yeah, 1655 uh, yeah in March 1655 which is um, they employ militias in a way that becomes a prototype for what then becomes uh, the rule of the major generals, which becomes an official policy in, I think, October 1655, um, uh, just after the realities of the Western design has become known. By about September 1655, the catastrophe has been revealed, if only to this new ruling class that you now have this idea of moral reformation. Okay, we haven't gone far enough, uh, we must reform. And so you have what then becomes the rule of the major generals where England and Wales are cantonized, to use a phrase, and separated mm. up into different regions, uh, each under the power of um, a major general or their deputy, because uh, some of them have to be in London more often, such as say John Lambert who's a member of the council. Um, and so, their job is not merely one of security, because security is not that big at this point, because we've already been seen with the Penrod at Rising that the Royalists are in a pretty hopeless position as far as, as, far as any uh, um, real uh, prospect of regime changes there. So it becomes a very, very moral idea, but it annoys a lot of people, not just because of the Puritanism that's there, you know, which is very, a very extreme form, you know, closing down pubs, closing down races, gambling, all that kind of thing, which most of the people are utterly addicted to. Uh, it becomes more than that. It becomes this, this, this entire moral kind of crackdown uh, that's effective more in some places than others. Some of the um, major generals are more pragmatic. Some of them are crackpot fundamentalists. Mm. Um, and as you can imagine, it rather unravels. But as elites tend to do, they tend to talk to themselves in a bubble. And the major generals convinced that they're doing a really great job and that the people are absolutely behind them. 
why don't we go for elections to reinforce our status? And of course, Cromwell says, well, I'm not sure about this, but yet it's, it's eventually decided that they will have elections and they don't go terribly well so far as the major generals are concerned. And you get a lot of much more moderate uh, members of the parliament through there and including a number of people who essentially oppose the rule of the major generals. Because that's when it all collapses, isn't it? Because basically Parliament turns around and says, you know what, we're not going to fund this anymore. And the rule of the major generals collapses because Parliament ain't going to stump up the money for it. No, absolutely. And you've got this very, you've got the division that's been within the regime uh, now very much coming through to the surface because it becomes essentially public. Mm. And I think the way it becomes public, first of all, is through um, the example of James Naylor, the trial of James yeah, Quaker. Naylor. Mm. James Naylor is a Quaker, radical Quaker, um, uh, former quartermaster in Lambert's uh, regiment, I think, during the Civil Wars. Um, he is a brilliant polemicist. He's obviously a person of tremendous magnetism. Um, and in October 1655, he rides into Bristol on a donkey in imitation of Christ uh, with various followers, including one uh, very uh, articulate figure called Martha Simmons. Um, and this shocks the authorities in Bristol. Um, and they really don't know what to do. So they hand him over essentially uh, to the central government. Um, who are shocked by this and he's put on trial for blasphemy or uh, is called before parliament at one point but the problem is with the blasphemy charge is that because of the ideas of religious liberty that gone there the punishment for blasphemy is something like six months imprisonment at worst mm. and so you have those on the parliamentary side who are very committed to religious liberty uh, Lamb, but and indeed in the background Cromwell, I think his ideas of religious liberty are quite genuine, yeah. um, and those uh, Presbyterians who want to crack down. And what this trial reveals is uh, that division. It reveals very starkly the division within the regime between those who are more concerned with order than they are with liberty and uh, to, to, to simplify a great deal. And this becomes a big problem. And I think from then on, uh, we have a number of problems there. Liberty, this question of liberty versus security becomes apparent again with what is called uh, the syndicum plot, uh, which is the um, brainchild of one Edward Sexby, um, who has the whiff of sulfur about him, this man very much, I think, who <laughs> is, is a radical. Yes. And yet so he's very happy to team up with royalists as well, just to overthrow this regime, in a sense, throwing the cards up in the air and seeing where they fall. So desperate is he. And he finds a person to carry out uh, the assassination, essentially, of Cromwell. And there's been various attempts to do this. And he, and he finds this person called Mar Syndicum. And essentially, it's something very similar to the gunpowder plot um, that tried to um, kill James I, Charles I's father. Um, a plot is discovered, one of the conspirators actually reveals it um, to the regime and Syndicum's arrested and uh, it's actually revealed in, I think it's 19th of January 1656, it's revealed to Parliament. And again the issue of security raises itself. And also then the crucial issue of succession becomes apparent. Cromwell is old, you know, he's approaching his late 50s, um, and that's pretty old for the time, and it's and it's uh, that's uh, made worse, of course, by the fact that he's been a military commander. He probably suffered from malaria. It's a race about some dysentery, gout. He's not in the best of health, and so it becomes very, very apparent to the regime that they've got to have some way if they're going to sustain themselves. Who is going to take over from uh, Cromwell? I mean, this is the, 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 the 
the, 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 the syndicum thing I think is fascinating and I think we'll probably do a whole video on them later because I, I regard them as like the keystone cops of assassins. Uh, <laughs> they have like a, a whole series of uh, assassination attempts on Cromwell, each of which is more ridiculous and disastrous than the last. They're, 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 they're the world's most incompetent uh, bunch of plotters going, I think, uh, in many yeah. respects. Yeah, um, magnificently bad. <laughs> but definitely. Um, I mean, following on from that, I mean, there's a sort of perception in terms of, I suppose, that certainly, I, I suppose, the, the kind of weak historiography, if you like, um, uh, that, that sort of, you know, the, the, the sort of the, the protectorate has the seeds of its own destruction in a way, really, I suppose, leading up to this, that, you know, it's inevitable as soon as Cromwell dies that automatically the restoration was going to happen. And that's, you know, with the wonderful benefit of hindsight and, uh, and, and everything else into the bargain. Do you buy into that? or um you know is is the sort of the the protectorate regime far more stable than perhaps we give it credit for well, i think it's i think it's very stable i i, I think if they had sorted out the succession mm. it may well have survived i mean the obvious thing to do there are those around him called the kinglings of whom roger boyle who's an irish um aristocrat is is most notable um who desperately seek the offer of the crown to Cromwell. And Cromwell is offered the crown under the humble petition and advice, which is yes. a slightly more restrictive form of the instrument of government. Um, and he obviously does consider it because it takes him a great deal of time to do it. But it's about six or seven weeks, isn't it? He <laughs> sort of agonizes and chews over it and has all sorts of people come to see him. And, uh, you know, they, they send him various versions of this, don't they? Sort of, you know, they, they, there's a lot of negotiating going on. He's not going to reject it out of hand. Yes. And it's not just them he's talking to. The person who's most important he's talking to is he's God. <laughs> is, yeah you, you get the sense of this constant dialogue that he has with god do i take this crown do i not mm. and he comes back with uh, you know i will not build jericho again god has mm. told him no the crown's been taken it can't be brought back um and yet i think had it been it's perfectly possible that a cromwell uh monarchy would have carried on perfectly normally within something approaching a constitutional monarchy uh, that, that eventually became the settlement. But, and so for religious reasons alone, I think, Cromwell turns it down. And from then on, there's a desperate problem because who is to succeed? Um, and what are the terms of this, that succession? Is the protectorate to be hereditary? Is it to be elected? Uh, it, there's all kinds of issues there that are never ever resolved by the time of Cromwell's death on the 3rd of September 1658. And there's, of course, Richard becomes the nominated successor, Richard Cromwell. Um, but there's even mystery about that. Was this the council interpreting, uh, people like Thurlow interpreting, the spymaster Thurlow interpreting Cromwell's uh, wishes? Was it Cromwell's wishes? Of, we don't know. But it's plainly obvious that Richard didn't have the support of the army. And no. that's a crucial bit. And from then on, radicalism returns. The kind of ghosts of the Civil War uh, and sectarianism become empowered again. And I think, again, cutting a very long story short, the inevitable is the restoration of Charles II, because it's the only real way to bring back any semblance of a sustainable foundation. Mm. It, there just seemed to be a sort of whole thing throughout this, isn't there? A sort of uh, a, a kind of um, desire, in a way, I, I suppose, in order to sort of go back to some form of stability, at least what they knew as stability, which is press the reset button in some form or another. So, hence the reason they pressed Cromwell to accept the crown, because well, we knew that worked. So let, let's go back to that. We'll just have somebody else who's who's wearing the crown. And then, obviously, uh, you know, what you can understand after the chaos of the the sort of two year, eighteen month, two year period after Cromwell death of them then wanting to do the same again or that that becoming the inevitable conclusion um do you, do you think the sort of do you, do you think the sort of the republic is a sort of a, a, I mean there's some people have sort of said it's a, a, a kind of glorious experiment or another failure or is it somewhere in between well 
I, I always have a bit of a problem with the Republic because yeah. it's not really a Republic. It is a quasi monarchical thing. You know, we've, 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 we've talked about, um, so this is the Cromwell King, Cromwell King in all but name, isn't it? King in all but name. And it's very, very convincing. I mean, you know, it is a quasi-monarchical rule. And I think that we see just how important the figure of Cromwell is in cohering it all, in keeping it all together. Uh, because, as you say, stability is absolutely crucial to the 17th century mind, as it still is in many ways now, to, to mm -hmm. a government. That is, that is the, the first role of government is is the defence of the realm, the, you know, the defence, the security of people. And Cromwell does offer that to such an extent that Hobbes, Thomas Hobbes, the great political philosopher, mm. adheres to the regime, uh, even though he's been the young Charles Stuart's mathematics tutor and he's a royalist by, uh, by disposition. He is perfectly happy to go along with the regime because it offers security and yeah. Cromwell and his group around him do offer that. There are some talented people in that group. Like you, that. You, you, can, you can imagine after the sort of the period of, you know, a decade of civil war where, you know, proportionately it's the bloodiest war conflict in, in, in British history. Uh, you know, communities have been ravaged, taxes have been through the roof, the world's turned upside down, all of that upheaval, people must have breathed a sigh of relief in some respects, at least some form of stability was there. Of course I did. And as we're saying, in, in terms of, al although um, the major generals uh, were often appalling towards uh, kind of former royalists, and that was a terrible strategic mistake, uh, particularly after the act of oblivion had been passed and many royalists or former royalists were at peace with the regime. Uh, yeah. That was one of the great mistakes of, of the major generals, is to, is to you know, poke that hornet's nest again. Um, but you know, security was absolutely essential, and it's plainly obvious that uh, Richard can't offer that. Mm. The the horrible the, the horrible menace of sectarianism comes back, and so you know, how do we resolve this? There's one easy answer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I suppose one final question, which I mean, I, I actually touches on something you mentioned right at the beginning. Really, I mean, again, it's back to the whole issue of, um, and, and I suspect again we'll probably do a whole uh, debate around this, probably with multiple one, multiple heads around the table to discuss this one. But uh, in broad terms, again, this is an incredibly significant period in our history. Um, you know, it's a part of the constitutional settlement, the religious settlement, and so on that we discuss, and is part of the development of the the, the sort of governmental system we have now. Um, and and yet, as I say, it's the period that we seem to know, or at least the public widely seems to know very little about. What, why is it, do you think, that the whole sort of the, the sort of mid 17th century, the Civil War period is, I mean, is kind of uh, glossed over? Is it too, people regard as too difficult, too complicated? You know, obviously, you know, Henry VIII and his six wives is lovely in terms of all the scandal and, and all that kind of thing. And that tends to be what the television documentaries focus on. Um, why, why, why sort of, why do we not know more about this? Well, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I do my best to rectify it. But yeah, yeah, as, as do we all, <laughs> yes. I mean, you know. <laughs> I, I think there is something there about uh, the nature of religion, the absolute mm. centrality of religion to the ideas that are espoused there on all sides. Um, the, indeed, the very concept of providence uh, is a difficult one for the modern mind to really grasp. So I think there is obviously a problem there in terms of the language, uh, which becomes part of uh, the, the very the, the very nature, the very air of this period is full of this kind of religious language, which I think can affect people. I think there's also the fact that Cromwell is this very divisive figure. Uh, and if you write about Cromwell, people still seem to think that you're a supporter of Cromwell in some way. That, yeah. that, and, and I find that quite bizarre. I mean, it's, it's obviously quite a fascinating character, a, a terribly fascinating character, as are many of the people around him. But to think that somehow you are a supporter of this regime because you write about it, I, I just find so strange. And, you know, it doesn't work anywhere else. And there's obviously still very, very deep... Um, divisions about this civil war and it's it's actually very difficult to get people who still regard themselves as being on one side and the other 
to talk constructively about it and to talk imaginatively about it. And I don't really understand why that is other than it still informs the divisions, the political divisions that we have now between, for example, Tory and Labour or Tory and Liberal, that we still inherit those divisions. You know, you see it in the Brexit debate. You even see it in many of the debates about the um, COVID-19 pandemic. Mm. There are still these very quite rigid at the extremes divisions where people are unable to talk about it. And unlike the Tudors who seem so far away, they're almost medieval. I know we regard them as early mm. modern, but, but there's, you know, parts of it are still the medieval state. Here we're close enough to who we are now that we're still playing out those battles. Mm. I think that so many of the issues that sort of are raised in this period are ones, you know, about the nature of freedom, democracy, uh, religious freedom, toleration, the ones that we're still wrestling with even now, the nature of press freedom and all sorts of things. Um, and therefore, it does seem, as you say, very close to home. It, it's interesting. Yeah, people do seem to identify themselves still as roundheads and cavaliers even now. So uh, that's how we go. Paul, it's been absolutely fascinating. And thank you very much for taking the time this morning to sort of uh, have a chat. And um, if anybody hasn't read it yet, then I do recommend Paul's book, Providence Lost. Um, and also please as well, um, as you can see, both of us are doing this from home, um, about a hundred or so miles apart at the moment because of the lockdown. Uh, but do take the opportunity, obviously, when um, we reopen to come and see the museum. Um, our job as well is not to be Cromwell's fan club, as we say, but, but to tell his story honestly and allow you to make your own mind up about him um, uh, do subscribe to our youtube channel do follow us on facebook and twitter do feel free to donate to the museum if you would like to do so into the bargain and uh, otherwise please stay safe in the lockdown and hope to see you again soon thank you very much thank you.